Bob Nagy, AB5N, with another equipment review. This time, the RSP-1 Alpha. Here's the one, here's the one Alpha, the new one. And this is the SDR Play, otherwise known as SDR Play, out of the United Kingdom. These are SDR receivers. And they made quite a big splash with the one and then the two. And now the 1A has just been released. Better performance at a lower cost. Can't beat that. These uh, reviews now, I'm gonna start to introduce a little bit of tech about SDR because there's such a buzz around it. The ICOM 7610, 7300. I'm going to re review the 7610 next, so stay tuned. Um, it's coming in tomorrow. And I'm going to sort of put a handle on these SDR concepts so that we can really qualify a, a, a radio, an SDR radio, which is different than a super head technology radio. So we're going to have to sort of shift our way of looking at things and the way that things fail, the way things operate, and how to judge the quality of an SDR. So I'm going to add a little tech in today. Then we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about SDR Uno, the software that's uh, packaged with this for free, the software, and how it operates. So let's get going. Well, we remember the old super heterodyne radio, the RF amplifiers, the local oscillators, mixing different IF frequencies, and then finally detecting the information off the signal and providing that audio to an audio amplifier. With an SDR, the A to D chip, or called the ADC, is the first thing that the RF is really going to be dealing with. And these are rated in bits. We might have an 8-bit, 12-bit, or 14-bit, or even more, and a sampling frequency. And this is really going to do the primary determination of the overall quality of the receiver. It's important to know that an ADC chip, an electro-digital converter chip's dynamic range is primarily based on the number of bits. And that basic dynamic range of the ADC chip is a function of how finely that analog sample that it's digitizing can be sliced up and represented. With less bits, there's more digitizing noise. And of course, we're trying to get clean digitizing from the smallest to largest signal. So as you see on the bottom, as we go up in bits, the dynamic range calculation goes up dramatically. The first generation of SDRs were what's called mixing or quadrature mixer SDRs. The A to D chips were not fast enough to really directly sample the RF. So we had to do a little bit of mixing to move it up to a, a situation where these earlier A to D chips could handle the uh, data and information. Recently, A to D chips have become so fast and so high powered that they're able to directly sample RF with a little bit of bandpass filtering and such before them, but they're getting much closer to just looking right at the RF itself. Let's look quickly at exactly how the signal gets through a direct sampling SDR receiver. Coming in the antenna, we go through the bandpass filters on most radios, can be broadcast filters as well, or pre-selection filters for the amateur band, then to that famous A to D chip that we've talked so much about and it's going to go ahead and sample all of the RF world and convert it into a digital bit stream that goes into the floating point gate array. And the floating point gate array actually sort of emulates some of the old analog functions in converting that digital data into a format and that can be sent to the DSP chip that it can deal with and understand and be able to use. So it comes out in digital form, all this still happening in the digital domain out of the FPGA into the DSP chip and we're going to see uh, the DSP do all the demodulation of the different modes, the noise reduction, the filtering, the notch filtering, emulating all of the analog world filtering and demodulation, and then uh, splitting it, uh, sending it over to the D to A converter, because it's still in the digital domain, converting it to audio uh, stream. Actually, there's usually an audio amplifier after that, and goes to your speaker. You saw it also branch off the FPGA to the display processing for giving you all of your uh, spectral displays and that kind of stuff. On the transmit side, we're seeing the mic audio coming in through an A to D converter chip to digitize the incoming audio. Then going through the DSP processor, which does all that simulation of the modes, FM, AM, sideband, that kind of thing. Sends that digital signal to the FPGA, that gate array, which does those pseudo analog frequency shifting things and actually generates the um, appropriate signal and that needs to be converted to analog in the next chip, which is the D to A uh, center there. That's going to be bandpass filtered after that. Now we're dealing with an analog signal. We've got the ALC, which is uh, working for us to get our levels right. PA amplifier, low-pass filter, and out the antenna. 
Getting closer to sampling that RF directly, using less components between it and you, between the RF and the AF, is going to result in necessarily a higher fidelity reproduction in the, in the entire system. Because all through the ages, we've been trying to fix image problems and other things by, oh, adding another uh, LO and shifting the frequency here or there. And every time you do add another one of these sections, you add another potential problem area uh, you know, you don't get something for nothing. So we got up, from, you know, from single conversion all the way to quad conversion receivers. But really, if you strip it down to basics and get into the digital domain and get to a direct sampling SDR, you've taken it right down to the uh, direct relationship with the RF, and you can land up with a much better fidelity. I'm calling it fidelity. Basically, it's linearity and fidelity throughout the system, resulting in a cleaner transmit and receive signal. Now, what's happened is. A lot of folks out there, especially Adam Farson, who's driving this, uh, is re-looking at how to test SDRs because a lot of the classic tests that we used in the past are no longer applicable to an SDR. And the number one that comes to mind is IP3, the third intercept point, because, boy, that was the number the uh, manufacturers would advertise their radios. So it's got a plus 30 or it's got a plus 40. But in an SDR, it just doesn't have a lot of meaning because what you're looking at is how much of an interfering signal is required nearby you to create problems for you in the passband that you're looking for, or you're looking at. And uh, with an SDR, that interfering signal starts coming up, but then all of a sudden it just plateaus and drops out and there's the, the two lines never meet, as you can see in the charts here. So um, that has to be replaced with something else. Now, there are tests that still make sense for both types of receivers, a legacy, traditional, super hat, or a blend of, and an SDR, and that's the minimum uh, discernible signal, MDS. We want to know, you know, how low can we go and still receive a signal down there in the noise. Our MDR, which is a reciprocal mixing dynamic range, this is going to be a lot more important in, with the SDRs now. Uh, so you're going to see that spec really sort of come up. We do still have intermodul intermodulation products, uh, uh, distortion products cr creeping up, so you're going to see that as well. Uh, but also in the SDR, there's no DR3, or DR3 is, doesn't really make sense to use in an SDR. So you're going to see the focus come away from the classic numbers onto some other numbers. Some of them still in common, but some of them now they're going to have a heavier weighting and some new tests uh, to look at SDRs. You might look at Adam Farson, uh, VA70J, AB4OJ, his, uh, his writings, because he is leading the trail on this. Two tests that I think you will start to see showing up to test SDR receivers is IFSS, that's Interference Free Signal Strength, that's testing for receive IMD products, and also NPR. It's an old uh, noise power ratio test uh, used in analog systems, but it's adapted to stress test SDRs. What's extremely important uh, in an SDR is the purity of the master clock used in the A to D chip or the ADC chip, that it's got to be ultra clean. That means the power supply feeding, it's got to be ultra clean. So that's where the weighting is going to go in to pr provide a really super clean clock signal because that causes problems if you've, if you've got noise on there. And also testing at that point, because we're getting better and better quality performance from an SDR, a lot of the traditional test equipment, um, its phase noise and its power supply is not that clean, and they're going to have problems you know, getting down and really measuring how low these things can go. Overloading of an A to D converter chip is a thing we want to avoid at all costs, and there's a lot of ways that this is done in a SDR, so there can be gain control in, in multiple stages there to be sure that we're never going to overload an A to D. Now, purely if you overloaded an A to D, garbage would come out, and it would be a horrible discussion terrible sounding digital bitstream of abject garbage noise. But then again, you're never going to see that happen in a modern transceiver. And you can have an overload indication that it's you're getting close to it, it's starting to happen. But truthfully, at that point, at that little knife's edge of it getting a little overloading, uh, those are really what we call soft overloading. And it can handle a little bit of momentary overload because it's very sporadic. It's not uh, all together at the same time. So it, it doesn't uh, go down the drain as fast as one might think. One of the things that ICOM and others uh, are implementing is bandpass filtering in front of the a to D converter. And, um, you know, this is just going to keep out all kind of loud, erroneous signals from getting in and blending and mixing because, you know, you still have opportunities for uh, IMD products and mixing of incoming signals that are happening, you know, outside of the chain. So you want to be sure that that AM station down the block that's running 10 kW uh, that your receiver's looking at doesn't get in and start to cause havoc. And to that end, uh, 
the RSP1A has a broadcast filtering in the front that you can click on and off. I have a, a big station down the block here, so it takes care of that perfectly. But the bandpass filtering is, is nice too because it really, uh, especially on RSP1A and others, uh, it pre-filters for the amateur band, so you're really getting, it's just seeing what it, what it needs to see. Now, I mentioned earlier about expanding the dynamic range of a A to D converter chip, and two types of uh, things are done. The first thing I want to mention is dithering, and basically you're still going to have mixing products occur and use possibility of seeing spurious signals uh, on the uh, waterfall and, and hearing stuff that's not really there. So dithering is often used. You're going to see a switch for that, say, on an ICOM 7300, 7610. Uh, uh, it's implemented in the RSP1A as well, and most times it's part of the ADD chip itself. It offers a dithering option. What dithering is, is adding, adding uh, noise to the incoming signal, and it sounds sort of crazy to add noise to an incoming signal, but why would you do that? Well, what happens is the random noise that you're mixing in, uh, sort of custom-tailored noise, is mixing with these spurious signals at particular uh, frequencies and blending them out to random noise. It's making them random. It randomizes them. So basically what happens is you're cleaning up the receiver in general, but you are bringing up the base noise level of the receiver because those spurs turn into white noise basically in the in the pass band of the receiver so the the noise floor can start to come up and of course that's a trade-off because you can start to gain oh uh, you know 510 db of dynamic range by adding this dithering but you're also going to bring up the noise floor what is really in consideration is real world situations of an actual operator because most people don't live out in a rf vacuum uh, i know i'm in a suburban environment here and i have got junk from TVs and all kind of noises and grinding noise. The noise floor just comes up from overnight. As long as things like this increased noise floor is not above your local noise level, you're not going to ever deal with it. So you can afford to put a little dither in there because most people's background noise level is not zero. The other thing that is done is decimation, and that's done in really in the nice higher class radios, and that is where the sampling occurs at a much faster rate than it really needs to happen to uh, get high quality uh, digital representation of the signal. So uh, decimation, like I said, by pretty much oversampling, allows us to, to uh, decode the signal, and at that point, you'll end up increasing the dynamic range, create what's called processing gain. And that means that the dynamic range is increased in its number of dB by the processing gain of oversampling and then bringing it back down to a, a usable level. Um, one of the last things I'd like to mention is latency. And that is, I think we're seeing a lot of that on the news lately, aren't we? <laughs> but uh, latency is a propagation delay of uh, the signal from RF to AF through the system. In other words, the computer and all the stuff that's in there, the uh, gate array and everything has to do this processing. And it's going to take X amount of time. It's going to take a certain amount of time. And generally in the world, we consider under 150 milliseconds to be somewhat real time, but you don't want to have a ton of latency in there. And so when bandpass filters are created mathematically and done in DSP chips on an SDR, uh, we have to sort of decide how tight do you really want those skirts? Because if you want a brick wall filter, you're going to have to incur some latency because it takes longer to do the processing. So it's just another, you know, always a compromise balancing act between what you want, what you'd like to get, and some trade-off. In this case, it's, it's filter skirt brick wall tightness versus latency through these filters in the DSP chip. So as you can see, there's a lot to consider when designing an SDR and the little uh, RSP1 Alpha. Uh, wow, all of those considerations are in there and you can come out with a really nice uh, performing receiver <laughs> for under a hundred bucks and designing, you know, balancing all those design criteria. And that is a nice little feat. So this RSP1 Alpha is a 14-bit SDR. That means it's much easier to hit the dynamic range numbers that we need in a good receiver. This makes the whole process easier. And they do use a few of those little tricks to even bump up the uh, dynamic range even more, the usable dynamic range. It has bandpass filters that are selected uh, on the input of this thing to keep out extraneous signals. That's very important. But even more importantly, it has broadcast bandpass filters for AM and FM. And I've got a big stick uh, AM or over here about 1,500 feet from me running 10KW. I've got to hit that button a lot of times to just cut that guy out completely from mixing in with incoming signals because it will overload and you'll see spurious products across the spectral display when you have a large 
AM broadcast signal or FM that's near you. So that's really a nice feature to have. Um, these boxes support the EXTIL format of software. And that is all the popular stuff, SDR console, SDR Uno, HDSDR. Uh, I used to like console a lot, now I switched over to Uno because Uno is really moving forward fast. And that's the one we're going to focus in on, take a look at its features. Uh, by the way, I put color tape on these so I can tell them apart, they look similar. So let's take a look at SDR Uno here as of December 2017. We'll just take a quick breeze through and show you how nice this program really is. These are the four panels that you generally call up when you set up SDR Uno. And these are movable by grabbing the top and replacing them any way you want. And then you can save your layout and come back to it later, however you like to lay it out. But the waterfall spread, uh, spectrum screen here, spectral display waterfall, seems to be the, the really popular setup. That's what we're going to do. We can click on the bottom left here and decide we want either or or both or an overlay, which is rather interesting. I'm going to leave it like this. And we talk about the first panel up here. This is your main operating panel and where you would close the program. It's the uh, first panel. You see up here these little designators tell which windows to open here. So you click on them and the rest of the windows appear. Or like I said, you set it up like you like it and save it as a layout. So right here we're seeing the processor loading on your computer and on the SDR Uno itself. And so that's quite nice and low right now. Um, this is the width of the area that we're looking at in the spectral display. So I can widen that out or, or narrow that out. If we do select an amateur band, these are completely set up optimally so that you're really seeing the whole band and you can zoom in, but all of the other settings are set for you. Here's our RF gain control over here. And as we go up, it's actually reducing the RF gain. And this includes the preamp on the unit. So you've got quite a you know, it automatically will kick on the preamp. So you have quite a, an amount of range from top to bottom, and it is very important to get this in the right range when you're receiving different bands uh, of, of signals because you can overload the system pretty easily. So down is all the way up gain-wise, and that's where I'm leaving it. Also, it's nice they pop up and show you what they are with a little, little window. This is showing that uh, decimation is set at 8, the thing we talked about before. Here's the two filters here, digital audio broadcast and a um, filter for AM, uh, FM broadcast stations if you've got one near. That really works. This is what starts and stops the device itself. So kick it and we start it. And you can see it, everything's rolling here. You got a little memory window over here where you can just hit store and you can put in a frequency that you're tuned to, save it for later. And these can be, I believe, multiple ones. If they, those can be set like different books of memories from what I saw. Maybe I'm not right on that. Um, I won't tell you everything about it here because I've still got a little bit to uh, to discover, but I'm going to show you how you would quickly get going. Your frequency window here is where you've got all your modes and bandwidth presets, squelch, volume control, and things like that. AGC, fast, slow, medium, notch filters, your bandwidth presets for uh, sideband over here, which are nice, and those change, of course. We went to CW. Those would be different filter presets. But you got a lot of mode selections, including a synchronous AM detection, which is nice, broadcast wideband FM and narrowband FM, even medium band FM, which is, is nice. And um, I've seen people even doing uh, digital radio mondial, digital shortwave decoding using this. It's not native inside, but you add the uh, Dream program to get to that. You might look that up. Got noise blanker over here and digital noise reduction, which is nice, which works quite well. And we have our presets, which are new uh, to the amateur bands here. This is a new feature I haven't seen in the software before. And bam, it just sets it up on all the amateur bands all the way up to 2 meters there. I'm going to go back to 20 meters. Uh, for FM modes, you can just click on the S meter, and it immediately goes to a discriminator centering meter, so you can tell when you're tuned into the center of the signal on FM. That's nice. One of the things you need to know is when you type in a frequency here, um, <laughs> you can get messed up on this in the beginning. I'm going to put in 14.1. I've got to press megahertz over here or an M on the keyboard so it doesn't go to 14.1 kilohertz. This radio will go all the way down to the bottom. So and you'll see all kind of wacky looking spurs and stuff way down there in the sub bands. This is a nice little um, zoomed in spectral display that you'll see. Uh, I've got it on the TS990 uh, Sugar, a separate display that'll just show you zoomed in on the signal you're looking at, plus a waterfall, which is rather nice. Um, I'm going to click on a signal over here, and I'll bring the volume up on it. 
Oh, we got a slide up here. Now, what's nice here is you can grab, like on the high dollar SDRs, and grab the bandwidth window and slide it right around the existing signal. I can see that this signal is running about 2.4 kilohertz bandwidth, and look at that. I'm able to create a bandpass filter right around it, and it shows me exactly what's happening here. So that, that's really cool. And, of course, you can hit the zoom button and zoom in on it, get closer to it or get further away from it. And this also has the waterfall and, you know, whichever display you want. All right, we're getting down to the main screen down here. All of these windows, by the way, have a setup button on the top left, and each of them has to do with that window. So if I want to get in here and set all my AGC time constants, I can do that right on our frequency window. And it's got a lot of the other stuff. Uh, including some pretty in-depth stuff like adjusting the PLL AGC time constant. Ooh, that's interesting. And uh, let's be sure we're not hearing too much of the audio, his audio, not mine. Um, on the main display down here, this baseline, you can see we're going down to negative 140. Uh, I don't know any receivers that can receive down to negative 140 on HF. So if you just click the setting over here, and then come on over to the setting window. You can shift the Spectrum's base down to a realistic level. All right, looking good. You can also shift the Spectrum's range. In other words, spread out that left, left side so that basically it's more sensitive. So you want your strongest signals to come all the way to the top, and you want the weak ones to be showing on the bottom. So we've got some adjustments here. There's waterfall gain. You've probably seen that before if you run any waterfalls. You want it so the strong signals are peeking out at white and yellow, that kind of thing. And also, this is very important, two, two things on here. Averaging and refresh rate. And amazingly enough, this little puppy can go very fast. Of course, it's your PC doing it. But you can bring this refresh rate up to, I mean, that looks like an old-timey uh, CRT uh, spectrum analyzer display. What you really need is about, you know, I find 26 frames a second to be comfortable. Uh, I'm not seeing a display of exactly how many frames that is, but... I'm saying that's a nice, fast display, but you know, that's not very useful. So what you want to do is hit a little FFT averaging. I like three, and look at that, how clean and nice that looks. You might go back to your refresh rate and go, uh, maybe I want a little bit faster. Maybe I want a little more averaging. And it quiets down the entire thing so you can really discern the signals above the noise level. So, like I said, each of these has their different adjustments, particular to the window you're in. On the FFT window uh, type here, Blackman is very popular for some reason, and I find that I, I like the, the look of it the best, and that how, uh, tends to be how the um, this is calculated here. A lot of FFTs being used in this fast Fourier transform. So there we go. We've got our S-meter here. We've got the waterfall down here. You, of course, you can click on signals here and immediately go to them, but when you want to see what you are, you know, if you don't want to zoom in, I mean, I can find a signal here and then go ahead and zoom in on it like that. But I don't really have to because uh, I've got it already zoomed in on the top window. The other thing is you can't really adjust this bandwidth down here in, in the spectral display, the large one. You can do it only up here. And I'm seeing this guy's oh, a little wider maybe than the other guy was. Uh, the other thing you need to know here is on the frequency display, uh, when you left click, you can decide what you want the increment to be while you're tuning. And you can use a mouse wheel to tune or you can use the up and down arrows on your keyboard. I find the up and down arrows to be really nice. Click to the general, you know, general area, and then sort of use your up and down arrow keys and, and tune them in. Uh, of course, you stop talking. So there you go. Uh, have fun. Now, the other thing is when you're off the hand bands and you just dial in a frequency that's, say, you know, 9.5 megahertz, um, sometimes you can get into what's called uh, zero offset mode. That means that you're seeing the LO in the center of the screen. We're not seeing it right now, but sometimes it, that little sucker pops up. Let's do, two, let's do uh, 25 kilohertz here. Let's see if it goes down that low. Well, maybe it doesn't. Um, anyway, all of a sudden you'll see a big fat carrier down here, and you have to set your LO. So if you do see that in the center, immediately click off to the side, and then you'll have offset your LO, and then go ahead and use the up and down tuning method so if you find yourself in that mode where you're seeing the LO in the center, don't fret. Just go ahead and click off to the side and then use your normal tuning method. You have a little offset from the LO. Uh, if I didn't mention it, I think I did. Yeah, this little window here shows the bandwidth. So if I go over to, say, oh, let's, let's do something fun here, 95.5 megahertz, I go to FM and I go to uh, wide FM. 
and I'll be sure my broadcast filters are not on. Um, for broadcast FM, I'm going to put the RF gain somewhere in the middle. It looks like my uh, spectrum base is, there it is over there. And then I want to look at about, oh, heck, 9 megahertz wide. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing the FM broadcast band. Looks like I can bring the noise floor down a little bit, the uh, base of the spectrum base, my little slider here. And all of a sudden, I am seeing all of these FM signals over here. And it's really nice because you not only get an S meter reading, but you get a dBm reading over here, signal to noise ratio. That's pretty slick. And let me tell you, this is a good little FM radio because uh, it can get signals which are, you know, really separated hardly at all. But you know, one super strong signal and next to it is a, is a weak signal, and it's able to pull it out and, and separate it. So we've got. Uh, go. Look at this big guy over here, and I'm decoding him and sitting right next to him. Very good. But if you do find that you're getting overload and all kind of stuff, if I turn the RF gain all the way down, gee, I'm not really seeing many signals. I turn it all the way up. It's still working, but I'm getting some some noise and junk a little bit too much, so I might, I might raise it up a little bit to where it's most well-behaved. And that's basically how to get into the SDR Uno, mess around, and have some fun. So in conclusion, uh, RSP-1 Alpha for $99 USD. Wow, what a deal. I mean, realize that a ICOM 7300 is a 14-bit SDR receiver in there. 14-bit. Not saying they're equal, but I'm just saying, interesting. Uh, any old laptop can run the programs for this, no problem. Doesn't take a whole heck of a lot of horsepower. And on the program, you can see how much the processor is being used in this and in your, in your uh, PC. A nice combination, a little sweet combination that I like with this is the PIPO 
wedge computer. It's a little wedge-shaped computer for $100, $125 that will happily run this thing all day long. Nice little standalone ultra-wideband lab tool, basically, in your shack. I mean, it's all a whole bunch of fun to listen to all those signals, but it's also very useful when you're testing equipment out and you want to see the signal. Is it clean? All these other things about it. So, um, as a tool for learning the dynamics of SDR, wow, because the whole give and take, the whole feel of what's happening, the interrelations of things and the way things fail are different in an SDR. And this is an absolutely fabulous tool to learn exactly what those relationships are. And in the meantime, you get yourself an ultra wide band uh, scanner receiver. I mean, it doesn't do scanning as of yet, but still, that covers some, you know, what I used to call DC to daylight. So, of course, I give it two thumbs up, as usual, and I think it's a great little Christmas gift for yourself. So, until next time, take care.